Good evening, I'm Wendy Mesley, and this is The National. Political outrage in Canada after a U.S. trade decision aims to brutalize Bombardier. A grieving Indigenous woman reunites with a man who revived the search for her missing sister. I'll be there to hold your hand. Cutting-edge prosthetics can change lives. But there's a catch. The vast majority of our amputees can't afford them. Plus, revered artist Ai Weiwei takes on the global refugee crisis. It only happened because we let it happen. For too many Indigenous families, vicious crimes go unpunished, victim stories are left untold. The National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls is now trying to address some of those injustices. But today it heard of a cold case that also formed a bond between a victim's sister and a former RCMP investigator. Neither of them could forget. Both of them wanted justice. And after decades, their paths converged. Briar Stewart has the story. Oh, this beat a lot of years. <laughs> oh, it's so good to see you. Me too. After nearly 30 years, a bittersweet reunion between a woman who lost her sister and a former investigator who tried to find her killer. Gary is a really big support. He's a big support. I can't thank Gary enough. Today, Gary Kerr is a retired RCMP officer, but back in 1989, he was investigating the death of Alberta Williams. The 24-year-old's body was found along the Highway of Tears. Her case is back in the spotlight as part of the national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. I'm sure it'll be intense when you're telling your story too. So, you know what? Though? But I will. I'll be there to. I'll be there to hold your hand. Kerr and Alberta's sister Claudia had little contact over the years, but that changed when he came forward to CBC's Connie Walker with information about the case tag along and hear what she's got yeah, to say. This morning before the hearing, the two reconnected. So it's better if I write it down, at least if I read it. It was time to say things that had been on their mind for years. When Kerr was investigating Alberta's death, he was in contact with Claudia's parents. It's always bothered me that they passed without, without finding out what they should know or needed to know. For Claudia, Kerr's support has helped her cope with the fact that even after all this time, charges haven't been laid. I am so grateful beyond words, the help that I have. In my heart, I know this will be solved. Then late today, it was their time to tell Alberta's story. She was kind, loving and a gentle person. Claudia believes that her sister's killer could be brought to justice and she says she wishes it was more of a priority. It would be different if we didn't find Alberta, but Alberta was found. There is her body and there is suspects in this case. As for Kerr, he told the commissioners that if he could begin the investigation again, he would make sure the police and the family had a better relationship from the start. I truly think if we had had more trust in place and that is with Claudia's parents, Claudia, the rest of the family, some of the information that I've learned just in the last year or two, I think would have truly made a difference. Without that trust, he says cases will continue to go on unsolved and families will be left still searching for answers. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Smithers. You can hear more about William's case and how a single line email from Kerr thrust it into the spotlight. It's chronicled in Connie Walker's podcast series, Who Killed Alberta Williams? Check it out at cbc.ca slash missingandmurdered slash podcast. Slapping Montreal-based Bombardier with that huge 220% duty may have been a big move by Washington, a big win for rival Boeing. But tonight, the Canadian government says it will fight the move every step of the way. And there are many steps to take before the tariffs will go into effect. But it's all happening as Canada is in the middle of renegotiating NAFTA with the U.S. and Mexico. We'll get to all those angles, beginning with Katie Simpson in Ottawa. Uh, obviously, we're disappointed by, uh, by the decision, and uh, I will continue to fight hard for good Canadian jobs. Frustration over the Bombardier ruling spread from Parliament Hill to the National Assembly in Quebec. Let me tell you, 
that the war is far from over and that we shall win. The foreign affairs minister shared Canada's disappointment with the U.S. trade representative who is in Ottawa for the third round of NAFTA renegotiations. A source with knowledge of their conversation says Robert Lighthizer did not appear surprised by the complaints and pointed out the ruling is preliminary. It's little comfort for Christopher Freeland, who admitted today dealing with a protectionist U.S. government is a challenge. Our officials in the department um, when they prepare memos for me, describe this U.S. administration as unconventional. And I think that is a really good adjective. The American decision to slap nearly 220% duties on Bombardier C-Series passenger jets sold last year to Delta came after Bombardier's competitor, Boeing, complained the Canadian aerospace giant sold its products at a discount because of government subsidies. The opposition is now raising concern this spat will sour NAFTA talks. It plays right into the NAFTA negotiations and the weak need position of the Trudeau Liberals on everything dealing with international trade. These are professional negotiators. They really are. They know their biscuits. They're very, very good at what they do and they're here to focus on NAFTA. But the government is being urged to retaliate and cancel its plan to purchase fighter jets from Boeing. Freeland did not go that far today but repeated Canada would not do business with a company attacking Canadian jobs. We are very clear with Boeing and with the government of the United States that a trusted partner is not one who is trying to wreck your aerospace industry. The decision to penalize Bombardier is another example of why Canada is fighting to keep a strong, independent trade dispute resolution system within NAFTA. If the program is dismantled, more American companies could come after their Canadian competitors. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. Bombardier says about 2,000 workers in Canada are directly involved in the construction of the C-Series jet, mostly at the company's Mirabel plant. About 1,000 workers at Bombardier's Belfast plant build the C-Series wings, but more than half of the jet's components are made by U.S.-based companies, and the construction of the aircraft supports about 23,000 jobs in that country. Despite the tough talk from Washington, this nearly 220% tariff is far from set in stone. We asked Jacqueline Hansen to help walk us through what happens now. There's no question that a 219% tariff would be a major blow for Bombardier, but this is just the first round in what will be a long fight. Most of all, there has to be proof that its rival Boeing was actually hurt when Bombardier won the Delta deal. The U.S. International Trade Commission will decide that sometime next spring. The thing is, Boeing doesn't have a similar aircraft in its fleet to compete with, and it didn't even bid for the Delta deal. Hard to get hurt if you don't enter the ring. But even if that goes badly for Bombardier, there are other ways for the company and Ottawa to battle it. They can take it to the U.S. Court of International Trade, make a complaint to the World Trade Organization, or dispute it under NAFTA rules. Canada has used Chapter 19 in the past to get duties on lumber removed. But before all of that, it could get worse for Bombardier. Next week, the U.S. Department of Commerce is expected to pile on more duties, this time for allegedly breaking anti-dumping rules. However these early fights play out, it underscores that Canada's exports, whether it's aerospace, lumber or dairy, are a target for an aggressively America first administration. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Coming up. It's a wild idea to consider white people a minority. In Donald Trump's America, a new group is feeling oppressed and that's changing the path to power. Plus, Shania Twain puts out a new album without the ex-husband who helped craft her biggest hits. Canadian talent like Shania will be front and centre tomorrow as the Heritage Minister unveils her vision for how to support Canadian cultural industries in the digital world. CBC News has learned part of that will include a big injection of cash from Netflix. Catherine Cullen is in Ottawa with some of the details. So, Catherine, what kind of money are we talking about? 
Well, we're talking about a minimum of half a billion dollars over five years, Wendy, and that is money that Netflix is going to put into original Canadian productions, according to our sources. Now, this could actually help resolve a bit of a conundrum for Netflix because it has been arguing that it is contributing to Canada with Canadian productions, but at the same time, it doesn't want to be treated as a traditional broadcaster because that comes with quota requirements for regulated Canadian content. There are financial requirements that Netflix isn't interested in, and it is Interesting to note that Netflix is already making productions in Canada, for instance, the series and that it's doing with the CBC based on the book Anne of Green Gable. So one big question here is going to be how much new original content is this really going to create? Another question for Canadian producers, how are they going to get a piece of this pie? But you can bet that when the Heritage Minister unveils her vision for Canadian culture in the digital age tomorrow, she will be suggesting that this is a win. Wendy? Thanks so much, Catherine. We'll learn to more tomorrow. Thank you, Catherine Cullen. Uh, today, the Senate heard from human rights groups about the situation with the Rohingya in Myanmar and received a grim assessment. We know that countless women, men and children have been killed, raped and badly injured, including being deliberately fired upon while fleeing. We do not have accurate numbers or statistics because of the restrictions on access. The Myanmar government did give access to some media today to display dozens of victims of what it says was a Rohingya terrorist attack on villagers last month. The militant group blamed for the attack denies targeting civilians. Arnala Ayed has been in neighboring Bangladesh all week and she will have more news from the field tomorrow. The Prime Minister unveiled Canada's newest national monument in Ottawa today, and he hinted the Holocaust Memorial could soon be followed by an official government apology. In 1939, our refusal to welcome those on board the MS St. Louis, European Jews seeking sanctuary here in Canada, led to the tragic deaths of 254 innocent people. The push for the $8 million memorial began a decade ago. Canada is the last of the Second World War allies to have a Holocaust memorial. Ontario wants it to be mandatory for healthcare professionals to declare any connection to pharmaceutical or medical device companies. The provincial Liberals introduced legislation today that would see, among other things, the creation of a searchable database that patients could access. Kelly Crow joins me now with more details. So, Kelly, they're called value transfer, transfers of value. What, what kind of payments are we talking about here? Well, doctors can be paid uh, consulting fees. They can be paid for giving talks. They can get uh, funding for gathering data for clinical trials. They can receive honoraria or travel expenses for going to conferences. And right now, there's no way of finding out who's getting that money or how much they're getting. So why is the Ontario government moving? Well, there's been a push by some doctors and some health policy advocates calling for greater transparency. There's been some research showing associations between doctor prescribing habits and industry funding. There have been some controversies over potential conflicts of interest on people setting up clinical practice guidelines. So Ontario is setting up this searchable database like in the U.S. where you can punch in any doctor's name and see every payment they've received from any company over $10. Now, there's still some details to work out. For example, what would the threshold be? How much could they get before they'd have to report it? Who is going to be captured under this? Will it be uh, healthcare professionals, including nurses, psychologists, possibly hospitals, even patient advocacy groups? Uh, but if the legislation is passed, Ontario hopes to have this uh, searchable database available uh, by 2020. Pretty interesting. Thanks so much, Kelly. Thank you. Kelly Crow. Straight ahead, some Nova Scotia families have lived on their land for centuries. Now they may get to own it. Ladies and gentlemen, our very own Tragically Hip. The hip have blues in their blood, rock in their soul. The guys burst onto the scene from Kingston. Their early videos identified closely with that city.
wanna swim. Now, well, their debut album with MCA identifies with the states. Lots of references to bayous and American cities. This song was written by lead singer Gord Downey three years ago in Kingston. But the music, in fact, the entire new album was recorded in Memphis. Why Memphis? Now, the music history and the culture is definitely the cornerstone, you know, of, of Memphis and it hangs very low in the air and you can really feel it. So there is a definite feel in Memphis, a feel that was an advantage for your recording. I don't know if, if we could put it into words. It was, you know, it's that southern drawl, sort of lazy music. You thing. guys were relaxed, obviously. Oh yeah. yeah. And that's important, isn't it? Yep. Saw a little cloud and looked a little like me. So after playing to rave reviews and sold out houses in Canada, is Tragically Hip putting Canada in the past as it tries to capture the U.S.? Was there a conscious effort to go to the States and identify with the States and get more fans in the States? Everyone knows that, that I mean, you can do as well as you want in Canada, but you're not really legitimate until, until you've done well in, in the United States. After the hip sold out appearance at Toronto's concert hall, they're off to the Maritimes, and you guessed it, a major tour of the States. The Nova Scotia government has decided to tackle an issue generations in the making, one that denied land ownership to residents in historically black communities. Today's move begins to address some long overdue accounts, even as it raises new questions. Tom Murphy explains. They built houses, live here, pay taxes. Despite all that, many residents here don't legally own their properties. They have no deed. Elaine Kane lived in this house with her mother. She'd like to leave it to her children, but by law, she can't do that. How can you give something that doesn't belong to you to somebody else? And it's been like that for more than 200 years in several African Nova Scotian communities. We are taking action to correct that. Today, on the heels of a UN report calling the situation an injustice, a provincial government promise of $2.7 million. It'll cover costs to search land titles, pay for land surveys, and hire staff. African Nova Scotians have suffered more than any, anyone else in Nova Scotia. Great indignities and injustices. It's going to be a complicated process. We don't have a deed to our land. Much of this land was granted to black loyalists beginning in the late 1700s for their support during the American Revolutionary War and after the War of 1812. Families have since come and gone, buildings built and torn down, property lines moved. All the while, the issue of legal title was never addressed. In the 1800s, they gave white folks land, but they didn't give us land. I'm finished. It's been called systemic discrimination, and it has led to a lot of mistrust of government. But now, some are beginning to see clear title to their land, finally. It just opens up, um, you know, some dreams that I've had, you know, taking care of um, the property and taking care of my children. Government is not setting any timelines, but it is promising more money, if needed, to right a wrong that's been two centuries in the making. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Halifax. A battle could be looming to keep a highly prized piece of war memorabilia from leaving Canada. A Victoria Cross we told you about last night sold at auction in London today. An unidentified British buyer outbid the Canadian War Museum paying $660,000 for the medal and eight others awarded to a Saskatchewan soldier for heroism during the last World War. But Ottawa could refuse an export license based on the cultural significance of the Victoria Cross. In Toronto this week, the Invictus Games are highlighting stories of triumph over adversity. Inspiring performances come down to true grit, athleticism and, in many cases, prosthetics. Devices that are more common than ever. But as Chris Christine Birak tells us, high tech can come with a high price. So let's play. Retired Master Corporal Etienne Obey makes it look easy. 
Canadian Etienne Obey. But the path he's traveled to the Invictus Games has been full of life-shattering hits. In 2009, then 28 years old, Obey was on patrol outside Kandahar when a roadside bomb exploded. I fell on the ground in the hole of uh, the explosion and the pains begin. Your life's never going to be like it was before. And well, it isn't, but finish. the advanced technology inside his prosthetic leg has also been life-changing. Technology Terry Fox likely never dreamed of. Gyroscopes, microprocessors and high-tech sensors calculating speed, direction and angles to avoid falls and mimicking what nerves and muscles do naturally. All these different things that allow the knee to know what the amputee is doing as they're doing. And it's updated instantly, I think. There's something like three to four hundred times a second. This workshop at Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto molds, shapes and fine-tunes prosthetic limbs. And relax. And relax. Back to the inside. This hand is top of the line. Oh my gosh! Electrodes placed on existing muscles help guide the prosthetic. Wow! <laughs> Amazing advances, but they're expensive. And unfortunately, the vast majority of our amputees can't afford them. Um, the government funding doesn't come close to covering some of those items. That's what I'm talking about, exploiting the legs. Obey says if the Canadian military hadn't paid around $100,000 for his microprocessor knee, none of this would be possible. Still can perform with this, all this uh, disability is pretty uh, motivating for me. Motivating enough to win silver. A hero twice over. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Coming up, renowned artist Ai Weiwei wants you to open your heart. Family. No family. His mission to wake up the world to the refugee crisis, but first, a powerful new wrinkle in identity politics, white Americans who feel oppressed. Let's check the day's business numbers. The TSX gained 135 points. The dollar decreased slightly. In New York, the Dow edged up 56 points and the price of oil increased 26 cents a barrel. For every performer you see on the screen, there are literally hundreds of people just outside the range of the cameras, each with a vital role to play. From the master craftsmen in negative film cutting, to the technicians who duplicate our scripts, from the artists who design our sets, to the delightfully eccentric genius who must edit this film you're watching. I don't think this will cut. Because CBC Toronto's job is serving the public, it must keep pace with community development, to go where the action is, to cover and report on a wide range of outside events, whether it be a royal visit, a football game, or a civic election. The Toronto operation has a wide scope, it allows the imagination to stretch farther than a camera cable. Over the years, the gleaming double blue of the huge three-camera color mobile units have become as much a part of the fabric of this growing city as her dazzling city hall complex. Now it's okay. Look, you stay. I'm all wound up. I gotta get away. No, this place is beginning to bug me. I'll go. No, no. If you stay, I'll go. I'll go. I ain't shit. Why don't both of us? The great bulk of present day programming is packaged and edited electronically under the nimble fingers of the videotape editor and under the eye of the program producer and script assistant. So that's the one that's about the third number on after the last one we saw. And we'll leave your levels up for a moment. Master Control. And as the name implies, these men and machines are the masters of CBC Toronto the flagship station of the English network. And it is through this sophisticated gear that every film, tape, or live program is funneled. The 
nerve center of CBC Broadcasting in Toronto isn't hard to find. Just peek under the tower. There you'll see the Jarvis Street Complex, the TV building, flanked by the huge Studio 7 on Mutual Street, and the annex on the right housing the CBC Executive Office. And over on the left, the one-time girls' school turned radio building. You won't hear much in the way of school cheers coming from the radio building these days, but you hear just about everything else. The radio sound effects department, kicking up a storm. We hope to get this from Washington, a $3 billion... Uh... CBC Radio News, one of the most versatile and far-flung news agencies in the world, with taped news reports and live feeds from the four corners of the globe. CBC News, Fine, thank you, Norm. Voice levels, please, uh, Jim, first. British MP Bernadette Devlin flew from Shannon to New York today on a fundraising visit. The World at Eight. Good morning from CBC News, etc. Fine, thanks very much. Hi, everything okay? Yeah. See you made it on time for once. Okay. The World at Eight. Good morning from CBC News. This is Jim Chorley with Rex Loring. Here are the headlines. Get that son of a bitch off the field right now. Out. He's fired. I've never said anything about race. This has nothing to do with race or anything else. When the U.S. president attacked NFL players who kneel during the national anthem in protest against racial injustice, he said race wasn't on his mind. But some notice who he attacks, who he defends, the color of their skin, and they draw their own conclusions. What was once left unsaid is now whispered. What was once whispered, sometimes shouted openly. As Keith Bogue explains, in the U.S. and beyond, politicians are making an appeal to white identity. The rally in Charlottesville, Virginia in August was never just about the preservation of a Confederate statue. The defiant display of symbols, the Tiki Torch Parade, they were meant to intimidate. All of it combined to speak to America, not reverently about its past, but menacingly about the future, and to speak about it like this. Jews will not replace us! Jews will not replace us! Whose streets are streets? Whose streets are streets? Whose streets are streets? Clearly, some wanted to provoke a violent backlash. <laughs> then, in one horrific clash, it all backfired. In what some called an act of terror, a 32-year-old woman was killed. Police arrested a white nationalist and charged him with murder. Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! We condemn in the strongest possible terms this egregious display of hatred, bigotry, and violence on many sides. On many sides. The president's on many sides, on many sides, even-handedness seemed to misunderstand the moment as though the bigots and racists really were no worse than those who opposed racism and bigotry. A couple of days later, he unequivocally called out the racists and other hate groups as repugnant to everything we hold dear as Americans. But then he switched back again. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it, and you don't have any doubt about it either. He condemned the white supremacists, but spoke of the symbols of white supremacy as equivalent to the monuments to the founders of the nation, Jefferson and Washington. Would those monuments now have to come down too, he asked. Because he was a major slave owner. Now we're going to take down his statue. So you know what? It's fine. You're changing history, you're changing culture, and you had people, and I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists, because they should be condemned totally. 
But you had many people in that group other than neo-Nazis and white nationalists, okay? And the press has treated them absolutely unfairly. What Trump and white supremacists have in common is that both are trying to exploit the anxiety of white Americans, trying to encourage white identity politics. Now, normally when we talk about identity politics, we mean the politics of the left or the politics of minorities. But white identity politics has always been available for exploitation in the political mainstream. It's just that until Trump, mainstream politicians didn't go there. Or if they did, they pretended they were doing something else. Governor Bush, a few blocks from here, on top of the state capitol building, the Confederate flag flies with the state flag and the U.S. flag. In the past, it Republicans have found ways to tiptoe around awkward questions about the supporters of the Confederacy in their base. The question is, does the flag offend you personally? As an American citizen, I trust the people of South Carolina to make the decision for South Carolina. But that's not Trump's style. He bluntly tells his supporters that there is a conspiracy to rob them of their heritage and that the mainstream media are behind it. It's time to expose the crooked media deceptions and to challenge the media for their role in fomenting divisions. And yes, by the way, and yes, by the way, they are trying to take away our history and our heritage. You see that. Our history and our heritage. That language is offensive to people who don't feel included by it, but it's effective in rallying those who believe in zero-sum politics, that someone's gain is always someone else's loss. He was trying to make it clear that he was defending the people who wanted to uh, oppose efforts to remove Confederate monuments. Uh, he was defending those people because that's actually a relatively popular position in this country. Vincent Hutchings, who teaches political science at the University of Michigan, has built much of his career on understanding how politicians talk about race in America. When Trump said that the protests in defense of the statue in Charlottesville included many fine people, he didn't mean neo-Nazis and the Ku Klux Klan, but he certainly meant sympathizers of the white supremacist Confederacy. And that wasn't cost-free. I think that it may undermine the Republican strategy of linking themselves with uh, groups that flirted with intolerance. The Republican Party has been doing this for years, and it's worth noting that prior to the Republican Party, the Democratic Party had been doing this. Uh, but even as both of these parties engaged in such political actions, they've tried to deny that that's what they were doing. Charlottesville makes that harder to do, because we now have a Republican president who um, is at least embracing some elements of racial intolerance um, in terms of the implicit message associated with the Confederate sympathizers. So help you God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. That this is happening after eight years of the first African-American president seems unlikely to be just a coincidence. With the election of Barack Obama in 2008, breaking along, well, a, a tradition that goes back to George Washington of white male uh, presidents, uh, a large fraction of Americans were disturbed by that outcome, were upset by that outcome, were challenged by that outcome. And this previously latent white identity uh, was made, well, not latent anymore. There's truth to that, but there's also more to it. On the other side of the Atlantic, white identity politics is also finding new salience. The changing face of urban Britain had something to do with the unexpected result of the Brexit vote to take Britain out of the European Union and try to seal it off from the currents of change in Europe. There were similar strains in the support for Donald Trump and the support for Brexit, things captured in the title of Justin Guest's new book, The New Minority, White Working Class Politics in an Age of Immigration and Inequality. It's a wild idea to consider white people a minority in contemporary society, and yet that is precisely what so many of the people I spoke to describe themselves as. They believe that white people are becoming a minority, disempowered in the country that they once defined. And I heard it over and over in different contexts, both in the United States and in the United Kingdom. It's this white minority consciousness that Guest's book describes as a transatlantic phenomenon. 
What we are seeing now is a transcontinental, a transatlantic politics of populism. But the populism is really derived in similar ways from otherwise very different circumstances. The number one factor is, is demographic change. So white working class uh, people in both the United States and in Europe uh, are, are reacting to, responding to transformative demographic change in the neighborhoods and counties where they live. Guest asks us to imagine Trump's campaign based on the slogan, Make America Great, instead of Make America Great Again. And we will make America great again. It's a different message. Make America great again conjures a time when America was a better place for white people, not for people of color or Hispanics. I think what's happened now is Donald Trump, from his uh, place on the, on the bully pulpit, has been able to awaken a sense of white consciousness, a sense that white people are in this together amongst people who may not have otherwise thought that way. And we're seeing this in a variety of metrics in, in polling research that shows that white people are more aware uh, of their sense of community, whereas before that really was much harder to define. John Sides of George Washington University, together with a couple of other political scientists, is about to release a study of 2016 election data that challenges the popular belief that demographic changes in America mean that what's sometimes called the Obama coalition of blacks, Hispanics, Asians, and college-educated whites is inevitably a winning coalition. So again, I cautioned in 2012 not to overinterpret the election outcome as suggesting that Democrats had it, had it made in these national elections. And I think 2016 shows you why you have to be cautious about that. We have to be careful, assuming that the Obama coalition is the ascendant coalition for the next generation of American politics. The success of Trump's overt appeal to white racial anxiety during the election and his continued signaling to a white sense of victimhood has taken politics in a direction others have been reluctant to follow before. Well, I think that the, the big question for the Republican Party in particular is what lesson you learn from Trump's victory. Is this the, you know, is his type of message or campaign the way that you win? I mean, electoral incentives are one thing, and those are powerful, but at the, I think what you've, where you've seen Republicans draw the line time and time again is that Trump goes further than they're willing to go. Um, and some electoral defeats beginning in 2018, right, would start to make them cautious about emulating his style of campaigning. Trump's approval rating is at an historic low for a president so early in his term. There are serious doubts about his competence, his ability to comprehend policy, let alone manage it, his understanding of the world. Those weaknesses make it harder to see how much the disapproval of Trump is a consequence of his substance and how much is only a consequence of his style. You saw that in the wake of Charlottesville. I mean, there's lots of Republicans, many of whom won't go on the record, but they're clearly very, very, very dismayed. Um, by Trump's reaction to that. So I, that, that, raises, that raises the question, right, of, of are, they, are, they gonna, are they going to embrace white identity politics but just in a somewhat um, politer fashion? Or do they want to, to continue to build a message that they think of as being perhaps more broadly appealing? And the question would be, you know, as of 2018, going into 2019, they'll have to make a, a a decision about that, in part because they have to decide, they meaning people in the party have to decide whether to challenge Trump for the nomination or try to otherwise usher him off the stage where he, you know, which he might not go gently. We don't believe in racism at all. The battle over Confederate monuments continues. Racists go home! Racists go home! This is Richmond, Virginia a couple of weeks ago. Those who wanted to see the statues go vastly outnumbered those who wanted to protect them. But the fringier groups of the American right, such as these advocates for a new Confederate States of America, have probably never felt so close to the mainstream of politics as they do now that Trump is their president. In honor of veterans, correct. No matter what war US they fought, veterans. U.S. veterans, American no veterans. No matter American, American veterans. veterans, no matter what war they fought, that is exactly like going into uh, the great grandmother's headstone and kicking to... it over. But they're not wrong to believe that at least for the moment, white identity as a political force is rising. We will make America great again. Keith Pogue, CBC News, Washington. 
Straight ahead, China's rebel artist Ai Weiwei. He wants us all to identify as human because millions of lives depend on it. The pre-dawn mist still lingered in the hollows when the crowd on the hill nestled into place for a good view. There were bleary eyes and lots of cameras. A few hours before, at 3.11 a.m. to be precise, Canadian Julie Payette and the six other astronauts made that short, exhilarating walk toward the launch site. The clock ticked closer to launch time. The Wheaton kids from Iqaluit and a few new Canadian friends unfurled the new flag of Nunavut. Across the water on the launch pad, Julie Payette blew a kiss goodbye from the door of the shuttle and was then strapped into her seat for liftoff. The Canadian children, winners of a Canadian Space Agency contest, clustered together. Three, two, one. And liftoff of Space Shuttle Discovery. First mission to dock with the orbiting international space station. Look at it! Wow! For eight-year-old Jessica McGrath Flemington of Winnipeg, this was all the career inspiration she needed. I think that is cool, and I would like to do that one day. Eleven-year-old Sarah Wheaton was in awe. It, it felt good and I was um, happy for Julie and that she's brave enough to actually go up in space. They dream of space travel, but these high school students won't get off the ground. Their spaceship is made of wood. Lift off. We have a lift off. Their command center, a couple of computer screens and walkie-talkies. Permission to execute. What is real is their respect for Julie Payette, who was once a student like them. It's a message of, uh, like, a dream come true. That's what motivated these kids to sleep at Laval's Cosmodome. No one wanted to miss the big moment. Julie is the first Quebec woman in space, he says. It's a great moment for us. And then, all across the province, kids held their breath as Discovery reached for the stars. And lift off. And at that moment, Julie Payette became not just an astronaut, but a local hero. And the vehicle has cleared the tower. It took a lot of courage to get where she is, this student says. I know she speaks like five different languages. She's like an athlete, a musician, and she's an astronaut, so I, so I kind of admire her. So it seems does the whole province. Payette gets star treatment in the media. And what's a hero without her own matching set of t-shirts, hats, pens, and even tattoos? A lot of hype, but no one is complaining. Especially not at Payette's old high school, where her picture hangs in the hallway. I think that she's a great model for us, and that just uh, show us that we can do something good in life. You're gonna crash! Lift, the space lift, club lift. simulated flight ended in disaster. But for teacher Joanne Patry, Julie Payette's mission is already a success. It got more students excited about science. The hoopla that we've been having for Julie Payette, it will encourage some kids at least to go in that <coughs> direction. I'm trying to see, you know, how they treat those people, how, how they share those very essential values. He's been called the world's most powerful artist and one of the most important activists of our time. Tonight, Ai Weiwei is in Toronto accepting his latest honour, the Adrian Clarkson Award for Global Citizenship. I caught up with him before the ceremony. But first, here's what you need to know. To the West, he's one of the most influential artists of our time. In China, Ai Weiwei has become much more. The once darling of Beijing is now public enemy number one. His unrelenting criticism of the Chinese government nearly cost him his life. In 2009, he was beaten by police and suffered a severe brain hemorrhage. 
after blaming the government for the death of thousands of children when shoddy buildings collapsed in the Sichuan earthquake. In 2011, Ai Weiwei was arrested and held in a secret detention facility for 81 days. He was released but held under house arrest until 2015. Shortly after, on a trip to Greece with his young son, Ai Weiwei witnessed a boat of migrants landing in Lesbos. He's been obsessed with the global refugee crisis ever since. Ai Weiwei has been busy visiting refugee camps and migrants in 23 countries. He's sharing the experience in his documentary, Human Flow, set for release in October. Ai Weiwei, it's a pleasure to meet you. It's nice meeting you. Why did you make this documentary? What drove you to do this? Oh, it's very hard not to to act in, in such a crisis. But uh, as artists, you have to find your own way, your own language to respond to this situation. I always have to try and find a language, build up this kind of communication between the people who desperate, has no chance to have their voice to be heard, then the people who privileged and uh, almost think those things has nothing to do with our real life and uh, turn their face away. So as artist, I always have to make this kind of argument and uh, trying to find a language to present my ideas. We've seen in Europe in particular, uh, in Germany lately, the rise of anti-immigration parties. Um, all change provokes reaction. Uh, where do you see this heading? Today you see news, they already start to build fences uh, on Mexico-US border. It's, it's so ridiculous. Now se 70 nations build fences. Uh, compared to 11 fences um, during the Cold War area, and that still reflects the same condition. So what's going to change that, this sense of us versus them that seems to be building everywhere? It takes individuals to bear responsibility. We, are have, we have to think the world is only come from uh, our individual's voice, and uh, we all bear responsibility to defend those values. But it's going to happen because we have to trust in humanity. I want to show the audience a, uh, a bit from your documentary. It's, uh, it's this man, he's uh, from Afghanistan, 17 members of his family, only uh, five of them now have died trying to escape, and he is now approaching a gravesite in Turkey where his family is. Let's watch this for a moment. پول هم رفت، آدم هم رفت، پاین کشی، پاین نفر رفت، پاین آدم. دو تا دا او کاش که همون بیا یک همی جای جای شوا. شوا خوام نمی برای دا خوام میهن، دا خوام. خوام میکنم، دا خوام دو تا میکنم، بچی کنم، بچی کنم حالا. What did that mean to you, meeting him? I think uh, it means everything. It, it, or for ordinary people, or for anybody alive, if you lost the people you're close to, and uh, you have a real sense of loss, of part of you is gone. You can see the man is deeply uh, saddened, but has no tears, you know the tears are gone. And, uh, and as a human, as a humanity, we can easily sense that could be our family or could be our brothers or sisters. So if that doesn't sense anything to us, then we ask the simple question who we are, you know. But hearts are hardening. Yes. Some, some are opening, but so who are we? <laughs> yes, we have to ask that question constantly, you know, to, to make a judgment about ourselves, because this judgment only can come from ourselves, and uh, that only 
can tell us what kind of quality and the life we are, we believe, we we live in, and、uh, we try to show the world who we are. You know, this is always a right question to ask. And if we never ask that question, our life is questionable. A lot of Canadians were really moved by that photo of Alan Kurdi、uh, on the beach, and you restaged that that photo of you lying on the beach. And a lot of people got mad. Why did you do that? And what did you think of the anger? I do that because I want to be in the same condition to touch my face on the sand, to hear the ocean, which that little boy have no privilege to do that. And、uh, that pl- little boy, Alan, is not a single person. It's thousands of refugee kids lost their life, and、uh, every day there are dozens lost their life. But some、so、people say, looking at that, that that was just a a stunt. I think、uh, most people they don't want to face in the reality. They re- want to either romanticize it, or to create some kind of notion. You know, this is something untouchable, which is absolutely false and fake. We let it happen. It ha- only happened because we let it happen. You know, I want to bring up this argument. You know, we all guilty. We all guilty in some sense because we know that going to happen. If we keep selling weapons to the dangerous area,、uh, keep initiate those wars, and、uh, what do we expect? You were imprisoned. You were beaten. Uh, you grew up in exile.、Um, I've read that you, understandably, have had nightmares. Does making this film, does this this documentary, does it does it help? It helps somehow for me to to see my own condition in the very large perspective of the world, and I'm so privileged still. Sitting here, have my voice and have my film、uh, are being shown to the world. But how to get the message through? How to bring more people like me to to pay attention to those people who never have a voice, and、uh, for generations they will never have possibility, and、uh, that is even much bigger responsibility. Your documentary is about refugees,、um, but you're still extremely critical of China. Are you are you safe? I think nobody's safe. You know, this is the, the I still think nobody's safe. If if you look up at today's political situation, things dramatically change. You know, our ideas, our our beliefs, which. Was established from long times of struggle can be deteriorated in, in one day or one night. So in that sense,、uh, environmental change, you know, all those、uh, things can happen. The, all the tragedies can happen beyond our、uh, expectation. You know, so I think no no one is safe. The actions of your father, who fell out of favor during the Cultural Revolution, and Was exiled, so you were raised in exile. Now your actions have led to your son <laughs> being raised in exile. What, what hopes do you or fears do you have for him? My situation is still much better than my father's. Those generation, millions of people dead in vain and、uh, silent. There's no single voice can be heard. Today I still make a very big、uh, voice. In talking about human rights and、uh, you know freedom of speech, and、uh, I hope I can create a better condition for my son's generation, and、uh, they don't have to put up the same kind of fight as his father and his grandfather did. It's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. There's still more ahead on the national. Stay with us. A year ago, this woman heaved a brick through the rose-colored picture window of the American suburban bungalow, and invited the resident housewife to take a clear look at the outside world. 
And you know, in many ways, it's more revolutionary to regard woman as simply another human being without any mystique than all of the rights that we won on paper many years ago and which, unfortunately, too few women have really used. You see, the feminine mystique has made us feel it's unfeminine to use our rights. You know, what kind of, what kind of girl is she? She seems like a real bitch. <laughs> but what I've uh, come to understand lately is it's not always personal. It is, is that all women come in for this kind of stuff because I keep meeting women who I've heard all my life are bitchy and pushy and so on and so forth. I meet them and they're, they're nice, compassionate people. It's, if, if you don't play your role, you know, if you dare to aspire to something, then, then you get it automatically. Well, I don't mind them consorting with truck drivers. The question is what truck drivers like to have neurotic women like you. You think uh, I'm a neurotic Well, it's a lot of truck drivers would be very uptight. Assessment. Why should you think that? I have controlled myself all the time in this situation. I have not insulted either of you, whatever uh, my private uh, opinions uh, may be uh, about I'm you. And saying... you have both. He has called my friends, he has called the women I work with by every filthy name he could lay his tongue to without being bleeped out. Yep, I I'm cannot sorry, have you sitting here I'm distorting my book for the people who are foolish enough to think that you know about things. All right, what, what did you I say about the truck driver? What I actually said was... The woman who is going to university, who has actually got a chance to read Marx, who has actually got a chance to figure out the way the world is organized, which is difficult enough, mm -hmm. had better justify that privilege and the money spent on her mm -hmm. by turning those advantages back to the people who haven't got them. I think that feminism has suffered from having the agenda be perceived as overloaded and uh, being hijacked by the left. A feminism that motivates all women of every background across the political spectrum to say, hey, I'm entitled to get in on this conversation is a much more effective guarantee of women's rights than a situation which everyone believes what I believe. It's a long-awaited date for Shania Twain fans. This Friday, the top-selling country star returns with her first studio album in 15 years. During those years, she's had to deal with both personal and professional setbacks. But Twain is back with Now, a work she says is very personal. Eli Glasner recently met with a Canadian singer who once ruled the charts. After years out of the spotlight, Shania Twain is back in a big way, appearing on talent shows, comedy sketches, and getting personal on her first studio album in 15 years. I wasn't just broken, I was shattered. Is this new album, is this Shania unfiltered? <laughs> it's less filtered. But there's something else different. I wrote the, the album alone, so it's, it makes it very personal in the sense that I was alone with my thoughts and I wasn't influenced by another, by somebody else's ideas. You're still the one I run to. That's a big change for Twain. At the height of her career, it was her husband, producer, and co-writer, Mutt Lang, who helped craft the country pop sound that smashed records. But in 2008, Twain discovered Lang had been cheating on her with her best friend. On top of that, Twain was struggling with vocal problems related to Lyme disease, which forced her to stop touring. So this new record is a test. To push myself um, through a threshold of, of, of that fear and, and not letting that fear get the best of me. But this music critic says Twain is returning to an industry that's changed. And it's also a very uh, youth-driven industry. Shania Twain, God love her, she's 52 years old. Um, and people often in that age group, they put out albums and it gets ignored in radio and in sales, but they do very well on tour. And Twain's already announced a global tour. She's been watching other performers and getting inspired, including by another Canadian. Would you like to collaborate with, with Drake? Mm, I'd love to. Yeah, yeah you know, I'm going to have to. Yeah, I don't know how I'm going to manage that. We're going to have to. <laughs> I don't know. I'll... I'll Okay, Drake. I'll, I'll get him somewhere where, he can, where yeah. we can get snowed in or something. <laughs> <laughs> Whether or not Drake picks up the cell phone, for Twain, the comeback is just another step in a larger journey. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto.
And that's The National for this Wednesday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to cbcnews.ca. I'm Wendy Mesley. Thanks for watching.